Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 79. As always, my name is Mark. I am here today with designer extraordinaire Cole Worley, and we're going to be talking about Cole's uh, game, some uh, design philosophy, and uh, particularly John Company, which is on Kickstarter right now, the, the second edition of John Company. Uh, Cole, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It's my pleasure, Mark. Thank you very much for having me. So uh, I figured in terms of what we'll go over today, I, I do want to talk about a few of your designs. I find them absolutely fascinating, uh, as well as your kind of your approach to design, which I also find interesting, especially when talking about games that are trying to try to say something, not just create a fun experience, but also make some kind of argument or look at history, um, which uh, I think makes uh, also for interesting design. But let's start talking about John Company. I have played I played once the first edition of John Company. I found it very interesting. The second edition, published by your publishing company, Whirly Gig Games, uh, is on Kickstarter right now. What was the approach in making the second edition? What kind of ways did you want to tweak the game? There were, there were a few things. I mean, I think whenever I'm working on a project, especially a second edition, I first take like a really close audit of what the first edition looked like and where I wish I would have had more time. The first edition of John Company, more than any of the other kind of early history games I'd done, was really the product of a, a pretty extreme circumstance. There was just a lot happening in my life while we were working on it. And I'm really happy with how it ended up, but I always felt like if I had had a little more time and a little more perspective, I could have reshaped it a little bit. Uh, so I knew I'd wanted to revisit it. And then when I actually approached revisiting, I mean, actually, for all the for all the words I might be able to spill on this, the, some of the, the initial tests are pretty simple. I think about when I teach the first edition of the game, what are the parts that I hate teaching? And I just kind of start there. And this is the, the, the same method that I use for Premiere. It's really the method that I use even when I'm doing the development of a totally new game. As, like th there is a point, and so we, we actually just did this with the hirelings, the root hirelings, where I was I was talking with the rest of the development team and we were just sort of taking stock of where we were and where we needed to be in a few months. And I said, all right, like when we go out to teach this, what are the parts that we feel like a little embarrassed by? That are like a little cringy when we teach, that we don't feel so proud of how they how they array. And then we actually go into the redevelopment trying to attack those areas. And we, with John Company, I did a kind of like cold teach where I just took out a legal pad and then I taught the game to no one. Uh, and I just took little notes. I'm like, oh, I, I hate teaching that phase. This is an awkward exception. You know, whereas in some, in some not every exception has to be awkward, right? If an exception um, sheds the light on, on some kind of historical wrinkle, then it might be a really good thing. And I might actually want to be elevating it out. But that kind of like aggressive teardown is really important to establishing like the mood of the redevelopment. And I try to be just really merciless with my own work when possible. And what were some of those areas in John Company that you, you disliked teaching? Well, there, there were some parts of the game that I just never even taught. So for example, like the event system, uh, which I was proud of in a kind of like abstract, you know, it, I felt like it was um, like a weird chamber piece I had written that was like never meant to be played, um, but but it was really interesting in the abstract. Uh, so, the, you know, the, the event system in the old game, I, I really liked everything it did on the design side, but I, I just wouldn't even teach it when I was teaching players and say, okay, I'm going to run the events. And if one of you wants to stay after class and I'll teach you how to run it, but I'm not going to teach you to the full table. And uh, there was a few other things. I mean, like in, in the first edition, John Company had um, a ranking hierarchy in the seat positions. There were senior positions and executive positions that had slightly different score conversions. And whenever I taught that, people would then ask, okay, well, what exactly is the scoring conversion? I'd start explaining that. And it all like worked out to like such a minuscule adjustment that it just felt like it felt crufty. Um, the way players took family actions how um, they, they would, you know, here's how a shipyard works. Well, it, the shipyard already exists, but if you build a shipyard, it becomes a little bit cheaper. Like that doesn't really make any sense, but you just got to go with me on it because of how the, the math pans out. There are just, there were tons, tons of things like that throughout the design. The way, I mean, I mean, I could go on and on. But one of my, one of my favorite ones actually was in the first edition, you could, in the company, you could invest in ships or goods. Now, what, what you were really investing in historically was long-term shipping leases versus short-term shipping leases. 
uh, which would then be offset by a higher quality goods. And this was a very fine distinction that led to a situation that when you would go to fill orders, you could fill orders by spending goods or ships. Now, someone would ask always, do I need a ship for my goods? And I'd say, no, 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 no. There are short-term lease ships that are carrying your goods over there. But constantly I would see them stacking their little good pieces on top of the ships because it makes perfect sense that you would use a ship to deliver a good and not that the good would have some kind of invisible third party that is doing, doing the, the delivering. So all that stuff got just, <laughs> just cleaned right out of the design. Um, so so the, the design is in a really interesting place because in its overall complexity, it lost maybe a thousand words of rules. Not, not a lot. Uh, it's a big rule book. But in its ease of play, it is dramatically easier to play. Uh, and it's just because all that stuff got cleaned out of the design. Yeah, I remember my my experience playing John Company, and it was it wasn't till the very end when I realized, oh, this is the type of game I'm playing. So, right, there's all these different roles you're taking on, and and all the different complexities of actually, you know, do you want to start a war? Do you want to, you know, how are you going to manage all this trade and all that? And then I remember getting to the end, and it's like, oh, and then you got to like cash in for points which is like you know buying a fancy hat mm -hmm. or uh <laughs> retiring in a nice location i'm like oh that's the game i'm playing is trying to just like squeeze and exploit and then buy a nice hat at the end and everything else was just in service of trying to do that which which is a fascinating uh learning experience for a game and you're like oh this is a really uh, brutal uh, attack on these people. We're playing the villains here. <laughs> well, and, and it, it, it's an instance, I'm afraid, of me. Um, it's a little bit like when you're learning how to write academic prose in grad school. And I certainly went through this. And I feel like most people I know who went through that experience went through as well, where when it's hard, it's because you're talking to yourself. You're like, you're, you're, you're so in in the weeds that you have like a hard time even telling your own ideas from the ideas of other people and you're mostly trying to explain them to to yourself and when like the moment where you break out of that and some academics never do uh is when you realize that like actually you need to be talking to other people and you shouldn't be burying the lead and you should be very forthright and clear about what the game is doing and how it's arranging so i mean it, it's amazing i would get i would get comments about the first issue of john company they were like i barely knew the game was about india i'm like wow i kind of screwed up somewhere along the line didn't i um, and, and so, you know, the whole, the, the whole presentation, the whole redesign of this, of this edition has been about recentering its arguments and its gameplay. Uh, and, and I think, you know, all of the abstractions that the first one um, trafficked in, they create friction for players. They make it just harder to think about the game. That was when we were working on Pamir, uh, my brother and I, we wanted to get rid of the opacity of game state. Like how easy is it to parse, to look at a board and know immediately what the stakes are um, because if if you are pick up that heavy lifting from your players then the players can use their mental bandwidth to think about strategy and immerse themselves in the theme and so you know what one thing that we were always watching for at john company was the first edition could be very exhausting to play it could and, and it was exhausting because it was a long game it was hard but it was also exhausting because the game was just asking you to do a lot of like abstraction and the second edition is much more immediate and it's after you you finish a first game you kind of want to play it again like it has that like you know just because it, it puts you in such close contact with what with the issues of the game that you you feel compelled to sort of like reorient your strategy and just try again um and so i, I always watch for a moment in game development when my play testers start playing double headers and it's usually a very good sign that things are starting to get close. Whereas in early in playtesting, they're like, well, that was exhausting. I need like a week break before we jump back into that. Yeah, and and I would think that that's even more important in designs like yours where there's so much there's so much interaction, right? There's so much everything is dependent on yep. everything else that the other players are doing. And so when you finish a game, you're like, oh, now I realize, now I understand like how the interactions work and I want to take another stab at it. Uh, that seems, yeah, like a, like a, like a good sign. What was the initial inspiration for John Company? I know you studied 
Um, uh, yeah. So I, so I, 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 I'm a Victorianist by training, Mm -hmm. which means I worked mostly in the 19th century and I was in the English department and I worked on novels, but I also worked on history of science and its relationship to empire thing and things in that kind of cluster of ideas. So I always had kind of like two or three feet outside of my own department. And I try to to have a pretty interdisciplinary approach in my own work. John Kepity actually dates a little bit before that. When I was finishing my undergrad, I was I wasn't really thinking about game design. I was really just thinking as a player, and I I got obsessed with this old Avalon Hill game called The Republic of Rome, which is an incredible design um, that is deeply flawed, but it does something that I I had never seen it a design before, which is that it put players um, in control of a single state collectively. And it was the first political game I played. And I've been playing a lot of political games. I mean, really all my life. Uh, but it was the first political game that actually like felt like history and didn't feel like, I don't know, Axis and Allies reskinned in space or Axis and Allies reskinned in ancient Rome. And if you play like Conquest of the Empire, which is another of the Milton Bradley Game Master games or Samurai Swords or even like Twilight Imperium 2nd Edition, Heck, even the newer Twilight Imperium, a game I like a lot. Sometimes it feels like it's pretty much operating in the same mode as those old Game Master games, which is you're going to put a bunch of pieces on the map. You're going to fight each other. There's an opportunity cost to the battle. You're going to try to politic. And like at its highest level of like political nuance, you had something like Game of Thrones or Diplomacy. And at the lowest level, you had something like Nexus Ops, which is, again, these are all games I really respect and like. but none of those games feel like history. Like they don't feel like how the states don't actually behave that way. The, the, the closest I ever got to that was we used to play diplomacy in college as a staff game where everybody would be apply, uh, assigned a, a supply center and you would have three or four diplomats in your little team. And then if your nation fell, the diplomat, uh, the, the nations that took over the, your various supply centers would gain your diplomats. And we would then shorten the negotiation round for every player that was eliminated. So by the end of the game, you had a staff of maybe six or seven diplomats and only three minutes to negotiate. And it was complete chaos. You usually play with maybe 15 or 20 people. Um, But that started feeling like the hustle and bustle of history. And the Republic of Rome just really captured it. Now, when I got really interested in the Republic of Rome, you could not find a copy. I remember I went to, to, to Gen Con to win it in an auction and it went for like $150 and I did not win this Gen Con auction for Republic of Rome. And so I remember wandering the halls, this is like Gen Con 2009 or something. And I was like wandering the halls being like, is there any game that's like this? I just want a game like Republic of Rome. Uh, and around that time, I had just started really learning about the British Empire and the East India Company and thought, ooh, I wonder if I, there could be another version of this game. And so I kind of like sketched out what that could look like. Now, at that point, I was just starting to really understand what the shape of the British Empire was. And so I was not in a position to like think about making a game. I certainly didn't know anything about making games. But that that thought just kind of like sat in my head. And then after I finished Pamir or actually even before I'd started Premiere, I'd started trying to flesh it out and work on it differently. And then it just kind of like, it is the the game project I've worked on the longest because it, it was always just a project that I would like slide into if I was in between other things. And it just slowly built and built and built and built. And, you know, there is, there is a degree to which Premiere and Infamous Traffic are like weird children to the John Company design, even though John Company came out after. Looking back now at uh, those three games, John Company, Pax Premier, and Infamous Traffic, do you see them as kind of three different uh, games in a similar, I don't know, I, I, not, not, obviously not a similar system, but like, do you see, yeah. do you perceive them as connected? Yeah, and, and the, the, this is a connection that came like a little bit after the, the fact a little bit. So I didn't set out, at, you know, I started working on Premier saying, I want to make a bunch of games about Empire. What happened was I wanted to make a game about empire and I didn't want to make a game that centered on the imperialists. And so Pamir was a game that tried to talk about empire, especially 19th century empire from the outside. Uh, And I didn't want to view it. I wanted to be very careful about it because I wanted to find a place where folks on the periphery exercised a lot of meaningful agency. And it talked about a particular phase of 
phase of, of the, the imperial project, prospect, whatever. And then after I did premiere, I, I, I thought about, well, okay, would it be interesting to do a game about people who are slightly outside of empire, but were imperialists rather than people from outside the system? So that's infamous traffic, which the, the players are not directly plugged into what we might think of as like the imperial apparatus, neither the state nor its sanctioned monopolies. They're right on the fringes of it. Um, and that could allow me to talk a little bit about how markets work and how markets, you know, interact with all these things. And then John Company is the game that is within Empire, sort of. It's within Empire in the sense that you are operating with a British footing. Uh, but where it gets complicated is, you know, 17, England in 1710 is not England in 1810 and certainly not England in 1910. And so what you're looking at is the kind of long story of the creation of what would become the like imperial ideology of the British empire. So this is like, it's, it's the prequel story, right? Now, as these things are sitting together, I started realizing that I kind of had two big takeaways, especially after working on the second edition of Premiere and thinking that I was going to be able, second edition of Premiere did well and has meant that I know I'm going to be able to revisit Jog Company. I know I'm going to be able to revisit Infamous Traffic. So now, because I know I've got some rope, I can start thinking about what I want to do with that. And, it's, and I, I realized that these games are showing, they're telling the story of empire in the long 19th century, we'll say. And they're going to do that by telling many small stories. And so I actually, I do, I do think about the games in a series, especially as they're getting reimagined into second editions that I can really sharpen um, how they present themselves. But it doesn't actually, it doesn't end with infamous traffic. I think there are probably th two more games that I would want to make to cover different parts of both like the, the what, what sometimes it's called like the high empire, like the late 19th century, and then also about decolonization. And so I kind of want to put the other pieces of the story in. Um, and then, you know, if someone were to go through all these games, I think they would have a pretty good sense of what it means to talk about the growth and collapse of empire and the ways it hasn't collapsed, of course, too. In the board gaming world, you know, there, there's been a lot of discussion lately on how to how to respectfully and appropriately handle these topics of colonization, of governmental evils of you know evils by any by any agent and i mean you seem to have just found the solution which is just presenting it in a straightforward way right i've, I've not seen any criticism along those lines levied against your games and i think rightfully so because you know for instance in john company like i said you're clearly playing the villains in that game mm -hmm. right and it's it's not playing the villains in in the way like in other games that have been criticized where you're just doing it for the sake of doing it. You're, you're playing the villains in order to communicate this this his, historical argument, this idea. Um, have you ever had any concerns along those lines that your games would be misinterpreted, that they would be seen as advocating uh, for what you're criticizing? Oh sure. I mean, I think this is a this is a thing that I think about a lot, and that we, we should be thinking about a lot. You know, m meaning is some is a negotiated thing. Uh, you know, the the author, the writer comes to the table, and the reader comes to the table, comes to the table, and the meaning of the thing is negotiated between them. I know that my intentions don't amount to a hill of beans, right? But I, if intentions don't matter, the game does. And production matters and the way it presents itself, the way it comports itself. Um, those are all things that inform that meeting. And so I try to really pay attention to those things. Uh, I think, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there, are, there are there are always going to be folks who are going to um, look at this project and say like, wow, I do not want to learn about how empire works. I find it really uncomfortable. Um, it's, I mean, I, you know, someone might say like, I recognize that this, institution uh, did a lot of harm to the world, and I don't even care to learn about that harm. That's fine. I have no, like, I think my, my, my if there's any way that uh, we've been successful, it's that we were just really clear to people that like, hey, this is just maybe not 
for you. Um, there are there are horrible events in world history that I too do not want to read about or learn about or certainly play a game about. But uh, there is value to it as well. And the way I tend to think about it, you know, it's funny. I got a I got an irate message from someone who said they uh, they accused me angrily of humanizing the bad guys. And I, I wrote back to them and said, well, that's exactly right. Like I am humanizing them and it's important to humanize them because they're humans and they did something bad and you are also a human and I'm a human and we can also do bad things. I mean, I really think about uh, Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem and like thinking about the banality of evil and the way that institutionality can cloak our moral grounding and that to me seems like something very much worth learning because if you're if you look back at the 19th century and you say like wow capitalism is evil imperialists are evil let's just not be imperialists or capitalists dust my hands off let's you know play play some game that just takes this setting and moves it to space or something that to me is like a bad take because it doesn't recognize the degree to which even if you're even if you take it to a, a a science fiction setting i love science fiction settings by the way i'm working on a game right now with one um that like actually you're you're hiding some of the implications of what you're doing and i want to be very obvious about the implications of what of of what what's happening um and so i you know i think my general attitude towards this sort of stuff is games are just a really powerful, they're powerful little sympathy engines. They really make, help players understand the forces that inform the course of action. And we, you, you want to use that kind of focus very responsibly. Um, but if you're, if you're careful to the history and if you treat your players seriously, there's a lot of good that they can do. Now, that it isn't like, I, I don't want to overstate what they can do as well because a game like John Company can't quite be as precise as like an academic monograph. Uh, it just doesn't have that. It, it just isn't quite able to do that. And I think that there are certain types of stories that don't re require the development of sympathy or the understanding of a system the way a game might. But I think in the case of the, of the British East India Company, it, it does. Now, I also like one thing I avoid a lot is the language of message games because I think that message games are kind of a different thing. And I think about like, um, oh, what is her name? I can't remember her name. The person who made Train. Oh, it's Brenda. Uh, something. Yeah, I, can't, yeah. I just can't remember her last name. Mm -hmm. um, so like Train is a message game. It's not really meant to be played more than once. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, actually, it's actually hardly able to be played, right? Isn't there like one copy or something? I I, yeah, it has I always a, pursued is just an interactive art piece, right? It's just right. Yeah. And and I think there's a lot, there's a lot of value to that. But what I want to do is offer players a space to play. I mean, in in almost the most glib sense of that word. And through that play, like John Company can be um it can be very upsetting, but it also can be very silly. And it can that silliness actually helps the game form a deeper impression. And then it's something that players it, like that impression is something that is re returned to or inspires somebody to go read a book on the subject or to deepen their understanding of it. And then so like the work that John Company is doing can happen outside of a game of John Company. And so I think that's what separates it from being like just a message game. And in the same way, like a big inspiration for me, uh, I just love the, the game Papers, Please, which is also a game where you're frequently asked and do quite evil things. I find the game extremely fun and interesting and like joyful even, but it's also a game that sits in my head when I'm not playing it and I muse on a lot. And I think at the best moments, I hope I want John company to kind of occupy that sort of space. Yeah. I'm, I'm remembering uh, my discussion with um, Mabel Holland a little while ago where she talked about how board games are uh, among the art forms, among the creative uh, arts board games are unique in that they are best at systems right movies theater paintings right they can they can really touch on uh, a variety of different things but they're 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 linear they're 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 giving you something concrete if you want to make a detailed argument write a paper but board games create systems and then let the people experiencing it 
interact within those systems and play around with the system. So they're uniquely uh, good at uh, at communicating what these systems are. And I think and I think your games really touch on that. In that maybe board games are perhaps one of the best media for talking about these kinds of institutional problems we have in the world, or at least, or at least just talking about institutions in general is because you're creating a system of incentives, just like in the real world where governments and private entities and, and businesses operate within this, this system of incentives. It, it's, it's much more directly parallel in my mind. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that's absolutely right. The, uh, one reason I, I prefer to work in board games, I mean, I have, I've never built a video game and I, I love video games, but um, board games really force players to know the rules. And that, that gives them a pedagogic edge as far as I'm concerned. There are other things that they can't do, which is frustrating, right? In fact, I, I just spent several hours yesterday trying to figure out a way to trick my players into doing division because I know division is a thing that <laughs> is just it's just difficult. And so you have to always build it into some other mechanism and hide the fact that you're making them do division. And you know, so there are always there are limits to, to the form too. And I, you know, I I should say too that you know, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna dump on retheming a historic game into a, a fantasy setting. Like, I think that's okay. I like doing that too. It just, it just changes the political imperatives of what you're doing. Right. So for instance, I, I like working in fantastic settings a lot and I'm working on some space games right now. And maybe someday I would love to take a version of John company and make it be about a big space corporation because there are advantages to it, right. By defamiliarizing the setting, uh, you can make it more broadly accessible, and by making the uh, by defamiliarizing the setting, it allows you to kind of do like historical like hodgepodge work or like montage. And I think about like root, where like roots. One thing I like about roots design is I can like put a Hobbesian idea next to a Lockean idea, and I don't need to worry about like finding a historical case study. I can just sort of like you know, pull it all into the realm of like animal platonics <laughs> um, and then and then we'll let those things sort themselves out, which is a lot of fun. Uh, but there is also, so like, I think there's a lot of value to that and I, I don't want to discredit it at all. And in fact, many of the ideas in John Company may go into another game uh, in the future, may, who knows. Um, but there is also value to being specific about what a game is about how it's, you know, and, and, and I think this project, when I zoom out and think about the work of John Company, I really do think about it as this is the second chapter in a multi-chapter piece that is about something very real. And I want people to know what it's about. And I don't want to be coy about what, it, what, about what the game is actually talking about. So there's a political imperative to the specificity. I realize it makes the game less accessible, right? It makes it less accessible to people who might have a, a, a distaste to that area of history, which is a perfectly reasonable distaste. I, I wrote in um, a little designer diary, I wrote that, you know, spending a lot of time uh, putting the British on blast is like a perfectly reasonable way to spend an afternoon or a lifetime, frankly. It's just that that's not precisely the work that the John Company needs to do. And so I think that there is value to the specificity, too. Mm -hmm. But speaking of that, I mean, it is a very niche game. And, you know, the kind of discussion we've been having here is, you know, to the to the outside observers, not particularly into board games, you know, they're probably not thinking about board games making arguments or establishing, you know, historical systems. But I'm looking at the Kickstarter page. It's already raised over half a million dollars. Was that something? I mean, what were your expectations going into this? I, I assume these have exceeded them. They, they have. Uh, so uh, my brother and I are incurable optimists about the work of others and pessimists about the work of ourselves. So we, we always like, I just, I don't know. It, it is wild to be able to spend my, my career so far working on board games. I, I am able to do this full time. And I know that the job I have is held by like maybe five other people or 10 or maybe 20. Uh, so th this is, this is an insane thing. And I feel like at some point, of course, it will have to end because all good things end, but that's, you know, that's also my, 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 my latent personal pessimism. Um, internally, our feelings about John company were the game would be about half as popular as Premier. So Premier has done very, very, very well, but 
Premier also has a fundamentally simple core. It has kind of a striking presentation about itself. They have very good reviews. Um, so we kind of thought like, okay, surely twice as many people like Premier is like John Company. So if this campaign would have done a quarter of a million or even a little bit less, we would have been pretty happy with it. Uh, we would have thought, hey, this is very reasonable. Uh, we can make the game that we want to make. Um, I'm not going to like be upset <laughs> or anything like that. It has performed quite a bit above expectations. And I think there are a number of reasons for this. I think that there just aren't that many people doing historical games like this. And so people who want a historic game that doesn't like, I think GMT, GMT's games are quite beautiful, but they also have like a look and our, and, and, and the, the, our, the productions at Whirly Gig are a little bit, they're just, I don't know. I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I, I think that we, we, we try really hard with our physical productions to make them special. And I think that that is attractive to people. I also think that the design is just, it really did clean up. And so, you know, for those reasons, the game I think has really resonated and I, it's, it's been really fun because we launched with very few first impressions. I mean, I basically, the way I generally do first impressions and things like that is anybody uh, who I know, they generally know what I'm working on, obviously we talk. And as we get up to the campaign, I'll say, hey, if anybody wants to play this, I'm happy to teach you. And if you wanna provide a quote for the Kickstarter, wonderful. If you don't, that's also fine. I don't really mind. Because I would rather launch a Kickstarter without any quotes and just a rule book and have the people who find it compelling back it than just try to make a big splash. And what I found was when I was playing it with people in that like preview period, it was really like lighting a fire in them. And I was like, oh, maybe we have like a second winner, Drew. I mean, I remember telling Drew right before we launched that like, this campaign could do really good. And we are we are like well beyond the most optimistic line on it. I mean, it's going to be incredible. I can't believe how many copies of this game we're going to be producing. Yeah, I mean, uh, you said you don't want to toot your own horn. I'll toot it for you. I mean, I think PAX Premier 2nd Edition is from just purely visual production is one of the most beautiful board games ever made. Uh, and well, thank you. this isn't the first time I've said this on this podcast. Uh, so long time listeners will know, I think it's stunning. I mean, in terms of just the aesthetics of board games, right? There's this, this once Kickstarter takes hold in, in the industry, there's this very much in my mind, an overreaction by mm -hmm. publishers to just like give the, the players as much plastic as possible and it's, right. and you get these in these crazy miniatures uh, that you know I, I've seen games where like they don't even fit on the board like you can't even like play with them really they're all jammed in there in this wad of tentacles and arms and limbs and stuff from all these monsters or whatever and I think uh, you know both with Pax Premier and John Company it's very nicely produced and, and everything looks nice but there's this noticeable amount of restraint of like oh everything's also going to be very legible and clear on top yeah of i mean games games have to be played right this is like the thing that i i just don't get like i like miniatures just fine uh and but i just sort of like sometimes i look at a at a kickstarter i won't name names but i'm like this just doesn't look like it was ever designed to be played uh, and it, it's interesting, we just finished at Leader, we just finished Oath, which is getting to people, I guess, around now. And we spent so long thinking about like, how big is this game on a table? How easy is it to pick up? How many different types of piece classes are there? And really trying, like, even though Oath is a very complicated game, like, I won't pretend that like, we're designing Spotted or something. But it, it, it blows my mind how whenever I look at the like, uh, let's call them like prestige euros, and I'll, I'll I'll even put myself in that camp of like, I'm making like weird prestige euros here. They're like, they're kind of expensive. They have fancy pieces. But what kills me is you look at the production, and you're like, there are 800 pieces. This is horrible. Like, I want someone to clean this up. And I, okay, so behind me, I have a copy of Feast for Odin sitting right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I actually, the reason why it looks like that, I know people are listening to the podcast, they can't see it. I have it upside down on my desk because I accidentally packed it upside down. And I was like, well, I don't want to repack this. So I just brought it into work upside down. Um, Feast for Odin, a game I like a lot. I would be like straight embarrassed to ask someone to set up a game of mine if it involved that kind of setup. <laughs> and I like Feast for Odin a lot. 
uh, like as, as a design, I think it's like really smart, but it just, there's so many pieces uh, and maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm being like a curmudgeon about this thing, but it, even, even as we go into John company, which is like a bigger game, it will have certainly more different piece classes than something like um, something like Premier. It still has like less than Twilight Struggle. I mean, that's Twilight Struggle doesn't have that many pieces. Yeah, it's got the special event tiles and things like that, or not event pieces. Oh yeah, not, yeah, yeah, it yeah, it doesn't have many. It has a lot of pieces that no one uses. Sure, yeah, yeah, it has all the all the. I forgot about the event tiles. Yeah, you know, I I, I don't keep up with like the Kickstarter scene that much. I can't I can't do it. I don't have the bandwidth to keep up with what's going on there. But I've always assumed that there's going to be a a, a a a pull back. Right? There's there's what I see is an overreaction to getting as much bling out to get yourself noticeable. There's going to be some kind of uh, movement to scale back and be more uh, more simplified. And maybe, I mean, maybe John Company is uh, indicative of that. It's like people want to see something that, yeah, is looks really good and is beautiful and looks fantastic on the table, but aren't don't care so much about you know the the number of pieces, right? You see those Kickstarter pages where it's like. Uh, you know, we have 10,000 pieces and they're like counting each individual card as a piece. And it's like uh, we worked for, for two years on Oath and Oath has um, about 300 cards, a little less than 300 cards. And I saw a quote on a recent Kickstarter campaign that bragged that they had like 2,400 cards. And I just thought, like, what a nightmare. <laughs> like, I just like, do you have you ever like really looked at 2,400 cards? Like, you know, what that never means uh, because that's a, that's a night. It's just a lot of cards. Uh, you know, it's, I, I, um, I, I'm pretty simplistic when it comes to the business side of the industry. And I, I always tell Drew that like, we're not really interested in growth. Like our main priority is like, we know that there are, there is a critical mass of people who want games like this. And so I will work on games like that. I'm not trying to like build a little board game empire or do anything like that. I just want to make sure that I can make games like this. And it's so it's like, it's an immense privilege, but it also, um, it, it changes the kind of Kickstarters I run, right? Because like, I'm sure there's some bananas way I could have optimized the John Company Kickstarter to be like a million dollar Kickstarter. But when we were doing it, we were like, no, this seems shady. Like, I don't want to put in that because they're just way, I mean, when, you, when you've built enough Kickstarters and you you really pay close attention to them, you, there are just ways that you can do that you can build your campaign to juice things. And I just think like, this is horrible. So like, for instance, we made the decision to offer players the full rule book right away. We didn't have to do that. And the rule book for John Company is 43 pages. Now, the font size is quite large. There are big examples on basically every page. So like, you know, I, I really like it as a rule book. It's like the Premier rule book. Um, but a smarter, a savvier marketer would have done a short rule book without examples that would have only been like 15 or 20 pages with maybe a slightly smaller font so that a, pl a prospective buyer would open up the document and be like, oh, it's only 15 page rule book. And instead, you know, I had a few, a few, there were a few folks I saw on Twitter who were like, yeah, I opened up the rule book. It's 45 pages long, 43 pages long. That's too long for me. I don't want to back it. And I think, yes, excellent. Like w our, our whole thing is just like radical earnestness. We're just going to tell people exactly what they're getting. And if they don't want it, that's fine. Because I, I know that there are kind of enough people who are going to be interested in this kind of work. And I don't need, you know, I, I, when we were doing the Oath uh, Kickstarter, we were very sensitive to like making sure we don't oversell this game because we know we had like the heat of root behind it and things like that. <clears throat> and so I was very clear in interviews that I did around that time that like, hey, if you love root, like Oath may not be a game that you want because it's different in these really critical ways. And I would rather scare off people than, you know get this in a bunch of people's houses and then never play it because my real priority is for people not to acquire the games but to play them and so that that's what i'm optimizing for mm -hmm. yeah and, and it's it's so cool that the hobby has become big enough where someone you know like you wants to make pretty niche historical games can now do that full time or look at like you know hollenspiel that can make really niche games with with just basic components print on demand uh they can they can 
maintain themselves as a company uh, and continue pushing out those games, even with, you know, I, I'm, I'm always reminded of the box for 4X, which basically lists all the reasons not to buy the game. <laughs> it's like an yeah. essay on the back. It's like, you probably don't want to buy this game. <laughs> and that can still uh, keep people employed, which is, is so cool. Yeah. And I, you know, I think it's, it's easy to give Kickstarter a lot of crap, but more than any other innovation in the board game world, it has allowed more people to work full time in this industry. Mm -hmm. Like period. The old publishing system would not have supported as many people's careers as are being supported by Kickstarter. And that is worth, at least in my opinion, that's worth every bloated weird minis project that I like to make fun of because it is, you know, look, there, there's, there's, there's a, both of these things can exist at the same time, right? Like uh, somebody can have a, a campaign with a million minis and, and cash pumps and all the little techniques you use to get a $3 million campaign. Uh, and then someone else can, uh, can, can just make like weird zines and derive like a, a reasonable standard of living from it. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that, that's really incredible. Just, just as a, as a, as a thing that exists. So I, I remain just tremendously grateful for the platform, which is why I'm going to like, just keep using it. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and I wasn't active during uh, in board games in like the early two thousands or the nineties, but I mean, you see the games that come out of there and there's you know, a lot of great games, but they're dominated by a handful of names. You got Knizia, you got Feld, you've got uh, Rosenberg and, 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 you know, the, they knew the, the people that made money and then publishers would invest in those people. Uh, and uh, you got a lot of great games, but from a limited number of people. And now, I mean, for instance, without Kickstarter or, or that kind of thing, you know, I don't think we see the popularity of 18xx games that we're seeing over the last couple of years. There's been a couple of notable Kickstarters there. I don't think Vital Lacerda probably gets the, the recognition that he's gotten without Kickstarter, right? Because you just see it. It's a Vital Lacerda game. You know exactly what you're getting. And a lot of people ended up enjoying that. But I, I don't know you necessarily get that out of the Eagle Griffin Kickstarter publications. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think Lacerda is a great example because his designs, I think, are so satisfying to the people that love his designs and so unsatisfying to anybody like slightly outside of that zone. Yeah. And I actually, so it's really interesting because I, I have very mixed feelings about him as a designer, but I feel a lot of like fellow feeling with him as like, Oh, you also have a, have a crew that's letting you make exactly the kind of games you want to make. And, you know, you're not really worried about the person who's like, well, I loved Agricola and really hated the gallerist. Like, I, you know, Lasarda can look at that person and say like, that I'm not bothered by that. <laughs> I mean, right, it doesn't, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. Uh, and so I think that, you know, you, you see a lot of these like little, um, these just these little communities or the one that I think about also is uh, this company uh, Goblin Co who does Den Dungeon Degenerates, uh, which Dungeon Degenerates is like this crazy open world game with like kind of a crust punk aesthetic. It's really cool. And they're like, doing good they're doing fine they have good kickstarters they've been they've been able to build this like massive game on the scale of like a big fantasy flight game and they don't have to worry about like appealing outside of their uh, outside of their audience yeah. now we, you have to be careful too because that kind of insulation can lead to biases it can lead to oversight and all and things like that so you always want to balance you know you always want to make sure you're finding, um, at least speaking personally, I always want to make sure I'm finding the people who are upset by what I do and making sure that I can hear them and then adjust my own platform. So I actually, I start every day by, um, I read all the new comments and all the products I've worked on, on BGG. And it's bracing, let me tell you. That's, uh, that's because quite a way to start people, the day. People, I, I have my tea I'm, I, and I just scroll through my phone and I'm like, wow, this person... He's so mad at me. I really messed up his birthday. And so like, I, but I want to hear that because it, it, it reminds me that the work I'm doing, even though it's just a game is also important. You know, it's, it's, it's important in its own small way. And it reminds me of the places where I'm doing okay. And the places where I need to get better. And if, if I disagree with, with, with someone, it tells me something, it, even the, the people I disagree with, if I think like, wow, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. 
um, there, it's still interesting just to have in my consciousness. So I, I, I really try to make sure I don't put myself in a little bubble and just keep making games, you know, for my little bubble. Mm -hmm. Let's shift a bit. There was one topic I really wanted to ask you about before our time runs out, and that is when you're making any time any type of historical game uh, simulation, or at least at least somewhat simulation game. There's seems to be this conflict, and and this is how actually the difference between historical games and Euro games was described to me uh, a while ago. Is that when there's a conflict between expressing the theme or the idea or the argument, a historical game designer will tend to side with the argument and a Euro game designer will tend to side with what's just most fun. And so it's always been presented and I, and I do see this and I, I remember hearing, I think on uh, Ludology podcast, Volko uh, Runke uh, talked about this as well in his designs. And I just want to hear your perspective on, do you encounter this tension? Um, and what's your approach for resolving it or tackling it when you have a conflict between, oh, this is the best, like this is the most historically accurate uh, representation of what happened or this fits into what I'm trying to do. But, you know, in, from a gameplay perspective, maybe this other choice would be more fun and interesting. Yeah, I think that's actually a very uh, beautiful way of talking about the differences between doing historical game design and just general game design. Um, you know, general game design, you can optimize a decision for fun or because you think it does it put some interesting pressure on a system. But when you're doing historical game design, you are having to answer to like a higher authority, which is like the record. Now, I get around a lot of this because the games that I'm doing are at a higher level of scale and they flirt more freely with a historicity. And that, that can be quite useful. Um, because when I'm thinking, for instance, about a period, I'm thinking about like a letter or a memoir that I might've read. And I want to make sure that for instance, the victory conditions line up with the objectives that the actors in the period were going for. Now that is a lot in some respects, that kind of uncuffs me because I, I don't have to make a game where, you know, you need to siege uh, like a particular city by this day in order to win the war. Uh, I can think about like, well, what would what would victory have meant for this actor? And then try to translate that into a game space. Now, all of my games, my history games, they, they play a little fast and loose with, with the truth to this consequence. So, for example, uh, Pamir. Pamir uses cards over about 35 to 40 years, maybe even 50 years in some cases of time, kind of from like 1809 to like 1850, 1855. Most of it's clustered in the 1820s to 40s. But because the deck's randomized, things can just happen completely out of order, right? You, you can get someone's son before the father shows up. Now, Part of this is that I don't want to railroad the game. Part of this is I don't want players to uh, stack their deck in little eras <laughs> each time. Um, but also part of this is because I want players to feel the uncertainty of the actors living in the period. So there's a question that sometimes gets asked. So for instance, John Company, we know that the British... East India Company gradually took over basically control of the full Indian subcontinent by the time the company was dissolved. Now, in the game John Company, that very rarely happens. The, the company often fails in the mid or late 18th century. Uh, there's all sorts of bad things that could happen to it. Sometimes it does succeed, but it hardly conquers any of India. Sometimes it conquers the full subcontinent by eight, you know, 1740. So what, what's going on there? Well, I think I I have a general, I have a general idea that the world like what happened wasn't necessarily what was like we have no way of knowing if what happened was the most likely scenario we can guess uh but we just can't know for sure and so what what the reason why i value primary documents so much is because they can give me a sense of the uncertainty of the people who know better than i what was likely to happen right like, I don't know, know what was likely to happen, but if I read, you know, the, the, the concerns of a provincial governor or, or someone working in one of the presidencies, 
they can give me a good sense of what they thought was going to happen. And I trust their opinion more than, more than my own. Uh, now, there are instances, though, where I have to like use the historical record. So like I, so I guess, you know, when I'm approaching these kinds of problems, I kind of put them into the kind of two groups, right? So one is I want to capture the spirit of the age, just the, the big stuff, right? And that includes the macro systems, the micro systems, the whole thing, right? The other uh, thing that happens in my practice, though, is sometimes I'll get stuck and not really be sure what the right way to go is. And this is actually happening a lot with, with John Company. John Company is very close to being done right now. But there are a few parts of the design that like aren't quite ringing perfectly. And so I'll give you an example of that. In John Company, um, there's a share system that determines the composition of the court of directors, which was the governing body uh, that appointed the chairman and that kind of ran the, the company. Now, this share system has, over the past two weeks, has been under a lot of revision because it just has problems. Like it has problems where it becomes too static or too fluid or this or that, and nothing what was ringing right. And the design is working. So like I'm at a very frustrating part of development where I will put push out a version and playtesters will play it and they're like, oh, this is great. Had a lot of fun. And I'm like, cool. Uh, I'm going to push out. I'm going to make some changes. And they're like, all right, it's great. Had a lot of fun. And I'm like, all right. I, I'm not really making the game necessarily better or worse. Or if I am, it's in like such small gradations. And so uh, we've got this, this shareholding structure in, in the company. And what I decided to do uh, over the past few days, so this is, this is hot. You're getting this bleeding edge development chat here. <laughs> over the past few days, I was like, you know what? The composition of the court of directors, let's just, let's just read about it. Let, let's take out all my, my history books about the East India Company and read about precisely what determined the composition of the court of directors. Okay, it was an election. It was stacked at maybe 24 members, et cetera, et cetera. It interacted with these different regulating acts. Learned a lot of very interesting things about like the regulating act of 1773 and how it shifted the way the electors were, were chosen and, and created it so that it works like the U.S. Senate that only a small portion of the of the court was appointed each time. Um, quick sidebar, a thing I would love to write about at some point is the degree to which the U.S. government is modeled off of the reformed British East India Company in terms of its governance. It's staggering. You just read all these things and you're like, yeah, when I was taught about like the Constitutional Convention, they would say things like, oh, this is just the brilliance of Hamilton. They came up with this out of whole cloth, this idea. And now that I know a little bit more about it, I'm like, now nah, they were just reading the British newspapers and they were like following the restructuring of the East India Company. Interesting. Because that was like cutting edge governance in the late. Yeah, yeah. And it, maybe there's a I always yeah. heard it went back <clears throat> just as far as like Locke and Rousseau. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. And, yeah. and it's like, no, no I think it, it, it's sort of like um, whenever Lincoln is being very poetical or something, there's a great book, I can't remember the name of it, uh, but like he might have just been quoting a play <laughs> that he had seen. And, and so like uh, there's all these like, really beautiful like 19th century like when you're reading like 19th century letters and you're like wow that's a gorgeous turn of phrase and it's like well he had just seen this play <laughs> um and, and it, you can find really funny um lines in that uh but as i started going through this thing i was like okay what needs to happen is the court size has to be fixed it, I, I'm obviously not going to make it 24 seats. That's much too large of a number for a board game, but I'll make it six. So it's a fourth as small. And then it needs to recompose itself based on the current share ownership in a proportional fashion. And like that, that is a very um, like interesting game design problem because now, and this gets back to my earlier comment about trying to trick players into doing division. I like sort of want to des design a clever system that will create proportional representation in this governing body in an organic way. And like, why am I doing that? Well, I'm doing it because there is this part of the design that wasn't really like clicking with the rest of the design really well. So if I'm going to rebuild it, I kind of want to rebuild it with a historic footing first. And then if it needs to deviate a little bit, it can deviate a little bit. But if, if the new if the new footing holds, then it, it will, or, you know, maybe the, the right way to say, and this is a bit of a rambly answer I'm giving you, but Maybe the, the way to, to, to frame it is so much of the rest of the design is historically grounded. So sometimes when you're struggling with a problem, if you try to figure out 
how to graft that history into the design, it will synergize with the rest of the design really cleanly. And, and it's because you're, you're building something that's already existed, right? So it's like, you know, you have, an, you have a picture in your mind of like a historic house, and then you go about building that historic house, and you don't fully understand the logic of like why this beam is connected to that beam, but it worked in the historic house, and it might work in your rebuilding of it because they're both like informed by the same core logic. Um, and, and that kind of stuff you just don't, get to do when you're doing non-historical designs because there is no like ur text <laughs> there's no like there's no record i can go back to um or if there is a record you know when i'm working on a design so we had a funny thing happen with the with some of the new factions for the marauders where uh if they were losing their little focus or getting a little complicated i would always like ask the developers like hey let's go back and think about what our words are in root like how is a society imagined in root how you know how do these things operate within the root system and then let's see if the factions have narrative resonance with the rules of root world because i don't want somebody to just generate some stupid mini game and then put an animal on it and say it's a root faction like the design of a root faction should be in resonance with the design of the engine of the game it seems like then that you don't i mean you experience that tension but it ends up you find that just going back to the history ends up resolving that quite frequently then yes sometimes it you know it's not a hard and fast rule but there have been many instances where a a problem is resolved by just going back to the record and really asking myself like okay what what actually happened and what would it mean for that thing to happen in the game, right? Mm-hmm. And so, and, and there are places where things like don't cohere uh, because, you know, it, it, if a game is producing something that like isn't explaining itself well. So like if something happens in a game because of the mechanism, the, the mechanical system created an output. And then you look at that and you're like, boy, that output like doesn't even ring true. It doesn't even seem like it could have been in the realm of possibility. It, is the design misunderstanding something about the historical reality that's then allowing the model to spit out something that like doesn't make any sense? So like, I mean, I really think about games as like models, right? I mean, you like you build a model, you, you put in certain inputs and then the model should produce certain outputs. And you don't, like anyone who's ever built a model, you don't just blindly trust the model's output. Like if the model produces something that's like insane, then there's something wrong with your model. I think about in the early days of COVID, looking at models of the um, of the new cases or deaths going down. And some of them were like, it's going to go like this. And it's like, well, that's that's clearly not true. And so like, just because your model says that like, it's going to all be over by Easter doesn't mean it's going to all be over by Easter. Um, and you, you could, it's really easy to build like a faulty model. Now, all of the, this is not to say that a game like John Company is overdetermined by the historical record. The game takes a ton, an absolute ton of liberties with how things work. So for instance, um, in John Company, all of the management of the company was handled by this body of people called the Court of Directors and various subcommittees that were staffed mostly by the Court of Directors. Now, this is just not how the game works. The Court of Directors hires the chairman who then acting on behalf of the court of directors will hire the director of trade who will then hire various other positions. And so to make the game work, I I treat it as a much more corporate and less committee driven institution because voting, like the work of a committee would exhaust players. And I have to be very tactical about when I put in votes. And so the committees are made a little bit more unilateral than they actually are. Um, and so like, you know, if you are the direct, you know, if, if you are the, the president of the bank, if, if you're in charge of the Bengal presidency, historically, that's a small committee being managed by another small committee. But we're just going to collapse those down into people because I want to emphasize the personal elements of the East India Company. And it would, be, it would be too easy to get everything lost in, in committees. And I recognize that I'm losing historic fidelity when I make that choice, but it's also, it's, it's made at the service of a bigger story. So there are lots of compromises like that. Mm-hmm. 
and, and in making those kinds of decisions, is there, when you design your games, do you have any like foundational principles that you return to, to try to adjudicate those kinds of decisions? Or do you just take it on a case by case basis? For instance, I've heard before where designers will say, well, for this particular game, I had a very particular feeling I wanted the players to get and everything every decision was around that trying to capture that feeling if i ever had a choice what best captures that feeling do you have anything like that or is it more complex with you i don't, I don't think it's more complex with me necessarily i think that i usually go into a design with a feeling or with like a you know i i used to think when i was working on oath i would tell people that oath when I was working on Oath, I was thinking about the conversation I wanted players to have when they weren't playing the game. And so like what sort of game would then produce that kind of conversation when a player wasn't playing it, which is like a very weird, like meta, like camera obscura way of, you know, like I'm like really looking at something at a big remove. And I think when I'm working on the history games, I have a similar kind of thing, which is like, how do I want this uh, to sit in a player's head? And so, um, I usually have a kind of governing principle when I go into a design. Like, for instance, in Pamir, I would always think about strategic inertia. What is the inertia of the decision that you're making? Because you're because you're doubling down on a like pro Afghan nativist position in Act One. How are you going to have to reckon with your own choices in Act Two? Like, what's the inertia like? And so when I'd run into a problem where I couldn't quite square the history or was having trouble representing something, I would think about like, I really want players to have to reckon with their own decisions because that, and, and that, that idea is informed by the design, but also informed by the research behind the design. And in John Company, uh, it's about leverage. It's about like, which of these is going to produce the more interesting lever systems of leverage? Because that is going to, torque the interpersonal drama that I see as like the absolute heart of the, of the game. And so I usually have like a more and kind of an abstract concept that I think of as like, this is the real heart of the design. And if I'm having to figure out the best way to capture some kind of historic tension, I want to use the way that is most sensitive to this central idea. And different parts of the design are going to be sensitive to different tensions. Like it's, it's rarely just one thing. Um, but in the case of John company, it's often about leverage. And so I really just want to make sure that that, that kind of holds together because it is, you know, it's a negotiation game and it's different from a lot of other negotiation games. Most negotiation games are about finding value. So, you know, for instance, well, I don't want to give a lecture about Ricardo and comparative advantage, but when you're playing Catan, uh, you know, ore might be worth something to you and wheat might be worth a different thing to me. And we, we can find a win-win trade by negotiating it. And the process of negotiation is locating the proper ratio of winning, right? And so like sidereal confluence, I think it was like one of the best examples of this because all the deals in sidereal are like win-win. And you're, you're just trying to get your marginal comparative advantage a little bit higher than the other players, which means most of the negotiations about sidereal are about finding value. Now, this is not any, this is very different from the negotiations in John Company. The negotiations in John Company are entirely about leverage. I'm going to give you something, and in return, I now own a bit of you. And I'm going to see if I can make that ownership of your position pay off for me in the future. Now, this is quite sinister. And it to me, it, it resonates with the game's history and with the game's thematics and arguments. And it also makes it just very different from other negotiation games. But those are the kinds of things that I'm kind of sorting through as I'm as I'm going going through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. When you when you were talking about this is a complete aside, uh, when you're talking about, uh, you know, weird, interesting historical things you found with the U.S. government and the East India Company, I was reminded of an economics paper uh, presentation I once attended about how pirates, I think in the 18th century, had developed an incredibly nuanced and complex system of insurance that was mm -hmm. far ahead of its time, apparently. 
I don't know why that that stuck out with me, but uh, yeah, pirates, uh, pirates had insurance locked down way before. Uh, the rest of the world, apparently. <laughs> Anyways, let's talk about what you have uh, plans for in the future. You implied uh, that you might be working on a new edition of an infamous traffic. Is that true? And, and what else uh, are you working on post John Company? So uh, John Company will probably keep me busy for the next three or four months. Um, you know, Whirly Gig is a, a an after work time. Um, mm-hmm. so it's funny, I actually got to work early today so that I could get some of my leader work out of the way so I could have this chat with you. Uh, and then I'm going to be going back to it after we're, we're done talking. Um, and I try to be very conscious about like really spending the ma- vast majority of my day, my nine to five with leader games and leader games related really thing. And then John company happens on the weekends, mostly and in the evenings. We are, uh, we have a lot of projects that we want to do though. It's so John company will take the next three or four months to finish. After we're done with that, uh, I'm working on two related projects, or two two not related projects, but I'm working on two projects simultaneously. I'm working on a project that, that is the redevelopment of Infamous Traffic, which I have no idea of how dramatic a redevelopment it would be. At this stage, I will usually say things like, this game could even have an update kit. Seems like I'm hardly changing anything. And I'm finding myself wanting to say those things again which means I really just don't understand myself. Um, but I, I, I earnestly don't know. I don't know. Um, I know I know what I want to do with the game's production. Absolutely. I know what I want to do with the game's production. I have no idea what I want to do with the design. And I'm also working on a game about municipal politics, which what I'd like to do with this design is I have a, a small background in um, community organizing. I did a lot of it um, in college and graduate school. And it's really important to me. And I would love to make a game that is a political game, but is very immediate. And so the goal that I have for myself in the back of my mind, and this is a pretentious goal, maybe, uh, and maybe I won't be able to measure up to it, but I would love to create a kind of universal system for political games, a little bit like Age of Steam, but for political games that would have a very low barrier to entry so that um, anybody could design for, and I would put it all in the Creative Commons where the other history games are, so anybody could use it. And it would be both interesting as a game, but then also have some classroom application. And so I want to, I've been doing a lot of research about the building of 94 here in the Twin Cities and the destruction of the Rondo neighborhood and want to think about using that as like the first module. And so it's a game that could be about, you know, the construction of a park or about gentrification and allow players to sort of see why a political game might matter and tell them a little bit about their world. I don't know how long that project's going to take, and I'm kind of in the early stages of it, but it's it's something I'd like to work on. And then for Leader, we're finishing the Marauder expansion right now, and I am working on a space game that we might be showing to people later in the summer. It's a little oathy. <laughs> That's fantastic. Always excited to see what you're working on. Thank you, Cole, so much for coming on the podcast. I found this discussion absolutely fascinating. I love hearing your thoughts, um, and I love talking about uh, how games uh, can model systems and make historical arguments or political arguments and all that. I think of the board game world, that is the thing that fascinates me the most. Uh, So again, thank you very, very much. It, it is it is my pleasure, absolutely, Mark. I'm, I'm glad to, glad to be on any time. You know, I think when when it comes to the question about games and history, someone asked me like, why did you why did you want to do John Company? Like, you could have done like almost any other game, but you kind of picked one with a thorny theme. And I said, well, you know, it felt urgent. It feels urgent because its topic is urgent, and there's a lot of forgetting going on about the British Empire, and I want to put you know, try to counter that in my own small way, but it's also urgent because there, I I don't want the the world of board games to be risk averse. I think people should um, try to tackle difficult themes and maybe they're not always going to be successful. Uh, And and in the moments when we aren't successful, we can learn a lot from, from the critique that is levied against us. But I just think it's important for folks to want to push the state of the art further. And so this is my own small way of just kind of inching it, inching it a little bit, a little bit on, I hope. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I, I, I still have in the back of my mind my theoretical design about regulatory capture. Maybe someday. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll, I'll 
Don't give up. I'll actually work on that other than just this idea. Again, thank you very much, Cole. I found this discussion absolutely fascinating. John Company is on Kickstarter right now just for a few more days. You can get PAX Premier through that Kickstarter as well. And what, whirlygig.com, we can find uh, your publishing company and then leadergames.com. Is that correct? Yep. You can find anything relating to Leader Games at leadergames.com. And if you're interested in following any of the design work I'm doing closely, I love to post about it on Twitter. You can get me at Cole Whirly. There you go. And uh, for more Thoughtful Gamer stuff, you can go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. I put everything up there. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. We're very appreciative of any and all support you can give through there. And I'm also on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.